<laughs> People love <laughs> Exactly. All right. So, as is our custom, let's begin with, uh, with prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Scriptures. We pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, they would be transformed from signs on a page into channels of grace into our hearts. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, we have um, with Psalm 79. Psalm 79 for today. And then after 79, we have, uh, we skip, we get some, some, we get the 80s. No, we actually, 80, 81, and 82 are all in the Sunday lectionary, so we're gonna, we get to skip over and make some progress. It's kind of like shoot some ladders where you get to kind of like, you know, go up a little bit. That's a, that dates me, doesn't that? Anyway, some of us anyway. So, um, it's a community lament, yet another, right? But now the community, uh, or the, the, is the, again, the difference between a community lament and the individual laments which, with, with which we've become familiar is that the community lament is, is organized around the, a complaint about what is happening to the nation. And so, therefore, we kind of, you know, when you, the, the community, of course, for those who follow Jesus, is the community of the church. Right, so kind of church has new Israel. Right, so when we hear community laments, we hear them as the people of God, as the church, as Paul in, in Galatians, at the end of Galatians, with, with peace be upon the Israel of God, meaning the Jew, Gentile, new people, right, that, that new ethnic group of Messiah believers. That's, I mean, and really we have this, this, this idea that that Paul really did kind of imagine this trans-ethnic grouping of Messiah followers as a new ethnicity, a new ethnos, literally in Greek, a new ethnos, a new people amongst the peoples, among the ethnoi. Um, so we hear this, but of course, as will be made manifest, we will have to hear this with, with, with Messiah ears, so that you know there's going to have to be some translating as we move from Old Covenant to New Covenant. In the language. So we're presented right away with the provocation, what we call either the provocation or the complaint, right? What is, in other words, what's the matter? Uh, you know, it's like when a child is crying, it's like, what do you got? You have, what's the matter? You know, it's like, tell me, you know, did you, did you, where are you hurting? So we tell God in our, in the, in the complaints, we tell God what, what's the matter? So here it is, this, it starts right out of the gate. Oh God, the nations, the in Greek and the Septuagint, be the ethnoi, the ethnoi, have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. Now, just a, a historical note here, right? So clearly, clearly, this is written from the context of exile. This is like the, the Jeru Jerusalem and the temple have already been sacked. This is a psalm that's lamenting the sacking of Jerusalem. And yet it's ascribed to Asaph or to a period long preceding. So what gives? Clearly the Israelites knew their own scriptures. It would have been, it'd be as obvious to them as it would be to us, right? And so that's why the psalms were considered uh, the Psalter as a whole was considered a book of prophecy. That is, it was a, that these psalms, which are written, you know, has, has songs of acute grief in the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonians. Over the next, you know, 300 years, when they come back, they are, in a sense, retrojected back to the period of the monarchy and, and, and basically seen as prophecies of Jerusalem's fall. This is why, in a sense, Jesus, because, that the, because this hermeneutic move was made long before, Jesus, you know, long before Jesus starts preaching in the temple, Jesus could grab 
uh, passages from the Psalms, like the famous Psalm 118, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And Jesus say, aha, aha, you know, how could David, who is like a Lord, being the king, say to the Messiah, his, you know, who would be a descendant, how could he possibly be a Lord unless he was actually before David? So, you know, and so clearly David is speaking about the Messiah that was so when you have capital L, that must be the Messiah. Here I am, blah, blah, blah. So Jesus could use that hermeneutic of Second Temple Judaism to make his point. He, he, could make, he could use that tradition of interpretation to make his point. But that's how the Israelites would read this psalm at the time of Jesus in the same way that, in, or the, that this development of, of taking the, the, the period of the exile and then, you know, kind of, um, kind of lifting, out, lifting out the, the things that happened there and kind of the characters of that time to another use, we can see happen in a different direction from the book of Daniel, where instead of retrojecting the exile to the past, like this psalm does, the book of Daniel basically takes the events of the Greek exile and places them in the context of of Daniel and the, the exilic period. So basically, you know, we know from the book of Maccabees that people were being roasted on on grids, on over fires. And so the whole story of the furnace, right? That is something that is actually people are being burned alive by the Greek occupiers, and so in a sense they would take the heroes of the community leaders within the exile, like, you know, there was a historical Daniel. There was, I, I have no doubt, there was a historical, uh, 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 me, uh, 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 what is it, what's the song? Meshach and Abednego, Amrak, Meshach and Abednego. Mm -hmm. That there were, those were figures, those were leaders within the community who also served in the Babylonian kind of state structure. Um, but their, their victory in a sense, is brought into the book of Daniel in a sense to interpret that if Jews stay steadfast during the Greek tortures and the Greek persecutions, that God, basically the message is God delivered us back then, he'll deliver us again. That's how that is being used. So, when the, when the nation remembers that the city was destroyed in the context of Roman occupation, right? So then they could hear, so the people of Jesus' time would read this psalm and hear... Hey, the nations have come into the inheritance. The Romans that, and, and again, the, the genius of the Roman Empire was that it was a trans-ethnic, unlike the Greek Empire, right? And the Persian Empire, actually the city of, you know, the Romans were actually quite adept at co-opting and including foreigners into their armies and their state structures and saying, hey, go conquer people, you know, and, and just bring us, the, bring us the goods. That's all we want. And so the nations of the, you know, so a Roman detachment would have, you know, in a, in a typical Roman detachment, you wouldn't necessarily see Italians, you know, <laughs> you could see Gauls, you could see blonde hair, blue eyed Celts, you could see all kinds of different people in a Roman legion and uh, unified by that, by their, unified by their allegiance to Caesar. Okay, so the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They've laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the air for food, the flesh of your faithful to the wild animals of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. So it's a pretty, you know, devastating poetic picture of the consequences of a conquest, of, of what happens when the enemy storms the gates, takes the city. Um, bad things happen <laughs> to the inhabitants. Um, so they've had, you know, in a sense, we, the, the scriptures, one way to kind of be sensitive to the scriptures, not only the Psalms, but really the whole Old Testament witness, is that the the, the Old Testament scriptures, I would say the scriptures, of, let's call them the scriptures of Israel, come to us as the scriptures as a witness of a traumatized people. I just think about that. 
It's so hard for us, I think, as moderns, as, you know, in our American mythic culture, we, the graph is always going up and to the right, we're winners. If we're not winning, it means somebody's to blame, somebody's screwed up, and it's, you know, we have to, you know, vote them out of office. It is, you know, that because we're winners, and so we need to get somebody else who helps us win. To be able to lean into and hear the witness of a traumatized people, of a people who have been finally and completely defeated. And that's something that I think we're kind of deaf to, honestly. We really have to work hard to recover the echo of the trauma of defeat. And, and, and it wasn't just like losing a game of checkers. This was, you know, bad things, horrible things happened to real people that they were related to, their descendants. Um, and so, um, in some ways, it's, it's uh, you know, it, the book, um, there's a, a wonderful short book called um, Reading While Black by Esau Macaulay, who's a, a priest, uh, an Anglican clergy person. He teaches New Testament at, at Wheaton. And he kind of talks about, like, basically the, the witness of the black church in America is a witness of faith and perseverance and this trauma of real trauma inflicted over time. And so in a sense, the scriptures of Israel come to us as that sort of trauma of a defeated, conquered people. So the, you know, in a sense, the, the, the shorthand of all this is, you know, the problem is we're, we, we know ourselves to be the elect people of God, the chosen people of God. And yet a trauma has happened to us. In a sense, so where we as Jesus followers now, I think where we can enter into this spiritually is, this, is when we, when there's that, we know that, we know intellectually, we can affirm doctrinally that God loves us. You know, God, I know you love me. I know I'm your beloved child, blah, blah, blah. But the world has come into your inheritance to your precious prize, me, and I've been defeated. I've experienced a trauma that doesn't connect with my identity, that what has happened to me does not connect with my identity that I know is your beloved child. So what gives? This is a problem. It, see, and, and it's only a problem if you believe God is good. It's only a problem if you believe that God loves you. It's only a problem if you believe in this identity, because if you don't, it's like, well, bad things happen. You know, it's like, that's just the world, and you're a loser. So get on, so... What happens when you're a loser? You say, typically, you, you, the response, you get on the side of the winners. It's like, okay, well, let's all go worship their gods now, or let's all become Romans, you know, which is, that was a, a move that many peoples in the ancient world made. Okay, we'll join, you defeated us, you killed our king, we'll join you now. You're the, you're the only show in town. And so when we, as God's people, when we know ourselves to be beloved, when we know intellectually, in a sense, we, we know our elect, our chosenness for good, for God's love. And then we have trauma happen to us. This is where we can enter this psalm. It's where we feel like all the landmarks in our lives have been wiped out. And that's really what happened here. Is that in a sense, the blood, of, and remember how, you know, remember, I'll remind you that for the Israelites, blood is like, Ooh, that's like mojo is in that, you know, it's like that's, and for blood to be spilt on the ground, the blood of the saints, the chosen ones, it, it, it would make Jerusalem itself unclean. To have spilled blood, remember like the story in Genesis uh, 4 of, um, you know, Cain and Abel, and the blood of Abel cries from the ground, it was an unclean, because Cain commits an unclean act, an unholy act. And the, the blood makes the earth unclean, and it cries out to God for purification in a sense that the, the blood of the people murdered in Jerusalem by the Babylonian army, it makes that whole place an unclean. Our home is unclean. You may have experienced this if you've had your home broken into, and that sense of violation and, and the sense of like what should be my castle, my fortress, my strong rock, my place of safety is no longer that, that you can get a sense of how the Jews in exile felt about Jerusalem now, that 
we want to go back, but there are problems with going back, right? It's, un it's been rendered unclean, it's been rendered unsafe by the blood of our fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts, sisters that, that were shed there. So this is a deep, deep pain that calls into question the future of God's people in God's city. And so they become a taunt. They, you know, and the, 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 what's the identity of the chosen people? The chosen people are supposed to be the glory of God. They're supposed to be a people that cause the peoples, the ethnoi, to give praise to God. Like, wow, that's something else. They've got quite a God over there. You know, maybe we ought to go find out what that God's like. And instead they become a taunt, a byword, right? A curse. Don't wind up like Israel did which is the inversion, is the perverse inversion of what their true vocation and destiny is supposed to be. And then you have in verse 5, the fundamental question of the sufferer, right, which we've come across before, which is really, this is lament, how long, O oh Lord? And we, we hear this cry echoed in the book of Revelation. So this is from all the way to the end of the Bible. The saints underneath the altar cry out, how long, O oh Lord? And and just that 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 cry is so um, is so radical radical in a sense of fundamental to the people of God that we're in a sense part of our you know I, in a sense I commend it to you. It's like right. It's kind of like you got the Lord's prayer, and then how long the Lord should be like right? <laughs> really? I mean, you're, you 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 are given permission. And in fact, encouragement to cry out with the saints, with the traumatized, with those who suffer, with those who are in pain, with those who grieve, to cry out with them, how long? How long, O oh Lord? This is a cry of the faithful people of God in the midst of the suffering in the world. Will you be angry forever? Will your jealous wrath burn like fire? So, in the psalm, right, it's the, in, the, in the anthropomorphization of, of uh, Israel's God is, in a sense, this disjunction between identity and outcome, if you will, is translated as anger. And in a sense, I think that's kind of what we, it, 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 that, 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 you know, get a monotheist, like, God is beyond anger. <laughs> you know, like God doesn't get angry about it. He just does things. Like you know, he's like you know. But that I think that's a good name. That really the psalm. I mean, we if we can just accept that for what it is. That in the scriptures, that anger, God's anger, is the human experience of the disjuncture between our belovedness and the lives we live. And when those two things don't match up, we experience that has anger from God, has God's wrath. I just made that up. That's TM. I want to TM that. You know, so, that's, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like for those of you watching, I'm like we get all this. But I, but um, but I I think that that is a way to think about God's anger in the Bible. And in a sense, so when people tell you, so here I'll quickly for apologetics. So when people tell you, well, the God of the Old Testament is an angry God, you can respond if you think of it at the time, <laughs> and they give you a chance. Actually, yes, there is anger in the, described in the Old Testament, but that's a symbol for the human experience of the, of the disconnection between God's love and the lives we live. And that's what the Old Testament calls it, right? And when those two things come into alignment, it's called blessing. <laughs> that's the, that, that would be the opposite, right? It's like the, we experience ourselves as blessed. Again, God loves us in both circumstances. God loves us, and that's as, that's what that's the bedrock of Paul's proclamation, right? I as what is Romans eight, right? The, but I am convinced. I love that for Paul. I am convinced that nothing can take us away. Not height nor depth, you know. 
I am convinced. That's the bedrock faith, that no matter what those circumstances, like, you know, like height, that all, basically the circumstances that we do feel ourselves separated by all those things in time, seasons of our lives, but we know that God loves us in Jesus Messiah. And so whether we're in blessing or experience God's anger, it's always in the context of God's love through all those circumstances. And that this, again, the, the Israelites, as the world's first true monotheists, were grasping for language to describe these human experiences of coming up against the Creator God who loves every person and God and humanity as a whole. How do you make those two things come together? Well, they, they reach for it through symbol and through poetry, right? God's anger. That God is a jealous, like, will your jealous wrath burn like fire? Jealousy requires love, doesn't it? Because, I mean, if you don't love someone, then, you're just, then it's just like, you're just like, you know, it's just murderous hatred. <laughs> like, but, but to be, you know, in a sense, a requirement of jealousy is that there's a, a form of love behind it, which isn't necessarily experienced by the person to whom it's directed. But do you see how even to say that God is jealous of us already there's the assumption of God's love for us, that there's, there's something going on in this relationship where God is refusing to let go of the relationship. Since, you know, jealousy, you know, and, 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 that the, and the Israelites um, experience themselves as in the grips of a God who will not let them go. And, uh, you know, Rowan, Archbishop Rowan Williams, I've said this before, I'll say it again. This is a favorite quote of mine of his. He said, hell, that, the, that, that hell is the burden of God's love on those who refuse to accept it. That he holds out, the, he holds out personally the possibility that there is a hell and people in it. But what that is, is the, that, that experience of being in hell is the experience of the burden of God's love on someone who refuses to accept it. That in a sense, even in the resurrection, God gives us the freedom to choose his love. And that when we choose against that love, we experience it as a burden pressing on us because it's absolute. God's love for us is absolute. So we, we experience it as a, something presses on us. I, it's just something interesting to think about. As opposed to hell as a place of punishment. But the experience of alienation or separation from God is really an experience of just being burdened by love. And, and I think we've, you know, just a human experience of that is like, you know, in, in junior high, when there's somebody liked you that you didn't want to like you. It's like, oh, you know, like stop writing, you know, stop leaving things in my, stop leaving hearts in my locker. This doesn't happen to me, this happened to friends. But <laughs> <laughs> what I saw occur <laughs> from other girls that I was trying to talk to was that it was a burden to them that I was infatuated. So anyway. Uh, so that's a burden. Sometimes love or attention can be a burden on, on those to whom it is directed. Pour out your anger on the nations. That's the, that's, that's the contrast. Instead of pouring out on us, pour it out on the nations that do not know you. And on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste to his habitation. Do not remember against us the iniquities of our ancestors. And again, this is, so this is clearly, this is kind of, again, retrojecting the past. Don't, you know, they're in exile. And they acknowledge that the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple was one that was, it was, a, ju was a judgment of God that was fair. Which, I mean, that's what I like, that's, that's what you gotta, I mean, uh, that's what I love about the Semites. I mean, it's like, they take the good with the bad. They're like, okay, if this, if there is one God, and the Babylonian gods didn't defeat our God, but rather our God permitted the destruction of our city, there must be a purpose within our election that that accomplishes. And the purpose would be that they, in a sense, they, as they, grappled with this, as they struggled with this, the purpose must be, if God loves us, and we're going to hold on to that, right, that he was somehow training us for some future, which is in his hands, right? He is, 
the discipline of the Lord. The, as the, as the book of Hebrews uh, quotes, uh, Epistle of the Hebrews quotes, uh, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. That in a sense, there's this idea that, again, if you believe you, God loves you, if you believe that you are elected and yet these things don't match, one of the kind of honest moves to make that is coherent is I'm, I'm being trained in some way. There must be a purpose in the training. Do not remember against us the iniquities of our ancestors. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us or uh, make speed to save us, as the, as the you know, suffering, uh, suffrages of the prayer would say. O oh Lord, make haste to help us, so God, make speed to save us. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us when we are brought very low. And again, it's like that anamnesis. It's like, please, God, forget. <laughs> Don't remember. Help us to remember your goodness, but Lord, forget our sins and iniquities. Um, help us, O oh God, of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Now they're starting to get it right. Not for our, not in a sense, look at it, just be sensitive to how, they, not for our sake, or to get me out of this jam because I just don't want to be here. None of us wants to be in the jam, right? Rather, deliver us, let your compassion come to us for the glory of your name. Let your name be glorified. In a sense, we, the, the Israelites are just, they hold on, it's, it's God's job to glorify God's name. It's God's job to glorify God's name. Which means we're off the hook for that in a certain sense, right? Um, but to glorify God's name over and above, for example, the Babylonians or the Greeks or the Romans or who, you know. Um, and ultimately, we as Jesus followers to glorify God's name over sin and death itself. That God is greater than our sins, as Paul would say. God is greater than our sins. God's power is greater than death. So to glorify God's name over, not enemies of flesh and blood. See sermon, right? This is that for some of you is coming, for others of you is in the past. Um, not enemies of flesh and blood, but the true enemy of our humanity, which is sin and death. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. This forgives, to forgive sins, this is one of the, the, the an example of, of the way in which forgiveness of sins in Second Temple Judaism is a um, is a para, is a poetic parallel to not quite the same but but also in parallel to coming home, return from exile. Remember, this is a psalm that's sung in exile. They just destroyed our city. Let your compassion come to meet us. Forgive our sins. That it is, remember, do not remember the iniquity of our ancestors. So the association is ancestors have sinned. There is there's sin. There's been a judgment, which is exile and the destruction of the city. So given that that judgment was for our sins, when we come home, we'll know our sins are forgiven and vice versa. When our sins are forgiven, we'll get to come home. And that is precisely what's in the background of all those dialogues with, for example, when Jesus, the paralytic man, says, son, your sins are forgiven. It means you can come home. You're a part of God's people. And the Pharisees are like, no one can do that, you know, because, you know, by the way, the Romans are still down the road. You know, it's like, you know, how can you forgive sins when the Romans are right? We can see them. It's like, we can see that from here. You know, it says they're right across the Sea of Galilee. There's, there's Tiberius Caesar uh, and his port right on the Sea of Galilee. That is, for, for the Pharisees, the idea is, the, the kind of the end game is that sins will be forgiven when all the pagan oppressors are gone and God's people come home to Zion, and that's how we know. And in the meantime, we got to wipe out sin through our efforts and getting those sinners of our own people to get their act together. Right? That's the Pharisaic... I mean, in, in a sense, I, I, I present that with some sympathy. I mean, that was one way to think about how this was going to happen. Because, I mean, everybody agreed, if you're a Jew, something had to happen. Because you know, this was untenable. The Romans being here is like, we're suffering. We're up. So how are we going to make this end? Well, that was the Pharisaic solution. And so, that, and so for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven, is to say, son, you, you're home right now, today, in the present, right? 
that a new people of God is forming right now. And that's, that's what's at stake behind all those, wait a second, you can't forget, you know, that what Jesus is saying when your sins are forgiven is, the exile is over, you can come home, you're a part of God's people now. Right? And so the idea, of, you know, the, under, the underpinning of the, the Sermon in Nazareth, when he says, you know, um, God showed grace to uh, the Syrian Naaman, you know, there were lots of lepers in Israel, but he poured it in. There were lots of hungry people in Israel, but he went to, with that message, the underlying message of that was when everybody comes home, Gentiles will be with us. And that was, that's what set them off, right? They wanted to kill them for saying something like that. Um, their sins will be forgiven too, including the sins of oppressing us, which is a hard message. It's, you know, in a sense, it's easy for it. It's easy for us to sit there here and say, oh, that's so narrow-minded of them. But just try having someone say to you, when you've been hurt by someone else, God's going to forgive them that sin. That probably, you probably wouldn't be just, now maybe intellectually you would be able to acknowledge that it's a doctrinal truth if somebody forced you. It's like, now do you believe that at some point they will be forgiven? But to have someone just come right into your kitchen and say, they are already forgiven for what they've done to you. Lots of us would have a hard time with that. I'm not saying I wouldn't have a hard time with that, right? And that's precisely what Jesus was saying to his people about the Romans who were in the at, very act of sinning against God's people, right? So let us, let's have some, let's give a little bit of, you know, slack to the people who reacted to that part of Jesus' message, because you better believe you and I would react the same way when it comes right down into our kitchens, right? So um, it's, it's a tough, as we hear in today's gospel lesson, it's a hard saying, who can accept it? Who can accept something like this? The, of course, the, the, the subtext is, only by God's help can you accept it. But anyway, that's a different sermon. I didn't preach that sermon. It's the past today, but you'll have to wait for three years. For me to pick that up. Maybe I'll have to write a note, right? Because I, I just love it. Anyway, so why should the nation say, where is their God? Yeah, come on, God. Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserve those doomed to die. Now again, as Messiah followers, we experience ourselves as those who are doomed to die under the power of sin. And so when we read this psalm spiritually, we can enter into it in that place. We've been doomed to die by what the world has thrown at us. Right? The world has decided that we're of no more value, that there's no hope for us, that there's no good outcome. We've been doomed. A sentence has been passed on us. Maybe not literally by a judge, but by the judge of this world and his powers. Return sevenfold into the bosom of our neighbors, the taunts with which they taunted you, O Lord. Note that they don't say the taunts with which they taunted us. And that's some Semitic monotheism for you, right? Because it's basically saying, hey, we're, we're, we're sinners. I mean, wait, we, don't, we, we have no room to complain. And that is actually a good spiritual strength. But we have no room to complain because we would be in on it too. If the situation is reversed, we say, I mean, a hello, Stanford experiment. We'd be pressing the zapper along with everybody else, you know, and if we were in the, if the positions were reversed, we acknowledge that we are sinners, that we're in the grips of, of sin and death. And so we're no better. But they've taunted you, God. They've taunted you. Then... We, your people, the flock of your pasture. That's a, that's a the repeating on a note from again from the Jubilati in Psalm 100. And the, the people, the people of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever, from generation to generation. We will recount your praise, and that's like one of those little verses that gets separated from the rest of the psalm and put on Hallmark cards. <laughs> you know, but that's the context of this otherwise pretty pretty dark psalm, but it ends, again, like so many of those psalms of laments do, on a note of praise. And that the remembrance of what this promise is, is that there will be a remembrance of God's goodness and mercy that will be passed down. 
generation to generation. We will recount your praise. So it ends on, again, no, just, I just want to note, uh, and this will be my last thing because we have to get ready for the next service, but the, how the psalm is so, so well built that it, it, it starts with the challenge to our own notion of election and chosenness, but it ends with an affirmation of chosenness and election in the sense of we're the, the people of your pasture, the flock of your pasture, that we are sheep. Again, the, we have to recognize the importance of the Old Testament identifying a defenseless herd animal as the model for who we are in God's sight. We're not lions, we're sheep. <coughs> defenseless creatures totally dependent upon the power of the shepherd to protect us. And again, that runs contrary to everything the world teaches us about how we're supposed to get on in life. But that's what we have to learn to, and what these Psalms can teach us if we have the courage to pray them. All right, that's it. All right, I'm in. Well, we'll see you uh, next week. We'll see you next week on Labor Day, or it's not on Rally Day. I'll, uh, actually, we won't see you next week because next week is Rally Day. And so we'll have a ministry fair on the other side of that partition. But then Labor Day weekend, I will labor forth again into the Psalms and Psalm 83. So anyway, thanks so much for being here and we'll get ready for the next of this.